Oh, what an atmosphere. Anybody can get up here and talk now. I want to thank the person that's responsible for these lovely worship centers every day. And they're changed, and I get to looking at them, and then that it's like a movie. And then, then another one, another view of Jesus, another view of worship, or he's knocking at the door. And I am just so grateful for these beautiful worship centers that you face and that you have before you every time we meet. I'm going to tell you a little story before I get, talk to you this morning, give my talk. I was sharing with, with Claudia and uh, Lucille just before we started, and I remembered how I got to the first camp. I, I haven't ever told this publicly. I had a friend who had cancer, and she was a younger woman than I, and uh, English, Episcopalian, very much a lady, and very much a loner. And she became very ill with cancer and was given at, at a certain point, six weeks to live. Well, I'd go over there, and because she was a very distant person, I did not, I, I just went. And if I fixed ba baked custard or something, I'd take it to her. She was on Gerber's baby food. And so she didn't go to church. In fact, none of the family went. Her father and mother and her, her aunt who lived with them good neighbors, but didn't seem to have much time for God. And so I was very concerned about Helen. <clears throat> she was a lovely, creative soul, had a radio program. And I, I kept praying for her. And I would take things in, and, and she would let me come in. Her parents and I were the only ones that she would let come into the room where she was. She was so sick, and she was so had lost her hair, and she looked so bad. She didn't want anybody to see her. Well. Uh, they read it in the paper or something. I don't know whether I told them or they read it in the paper. It was in the paper. There was a man in Dallas praying for the sick in a revival, revival there, and just tremendous things were happening. It got to the newspaper. And we were discussing it one day, and she said she'd like to go over there, and I, I really t got a shock treatment. She looked like she couldn't get out up to the door. She was so pitiful. We... But we went to Dallas, 33 miles. That's a suburb, 33 miles from Fort Worth. <laughs> we went to Dallas, and there was this great big tent, and it was full of people. And Helen was helpless almost, but she wanted to go, and she was an only child, and her parents got her there. We, they made a bed in the back of the seat of the car, and I rode... The three of us rode in the front seat until we took her to Dallas. And I don't remember how, I know she couldn't have stood in line. They must have given her a chair up there, but she got in line for prayer. And uh, this man, I don't remember his name. He, he was from the deep south somewhere. I remember that. And he prayed for her. And she stood while he prayed for her. And I thought, Oh, God, give her strength to stand there. And you know what that preacher did? He said, run down this aisle. And I said, oh, my God. She can't walk, you know. She started running right down the center of that aisle. And she ran around, and she, by the time she got back up here, where, she, where she, she'd been seated, she was, she was really running in, with force. And I saw the greatest miracle. But, before this, she wanted to get to CFO. I had talked to her about that. I hadn't been to one, but I'd been reading, and I took her books to read as long as she felt like reading. We went to a CFO in, in uh, Glen Rose, Texas, which is about 50 or 60 miles from where I live. And I took it, went with Helen. We went down there, and they started hugging her, and she began, uh, uh, you know, it just was... And she was so thin. Now, she wasn't as sick then as she was when she went to be prayed for in Dallas. I'm getting my cart before the horse. But she, she was very ill, and, and uh, the doctor had given her so long to live. And so she wanted to go 
down there and hear Star Daily and uh, Louis Eggleston, I believe, was the other speaker. And we went down there, and that was my first CFO, though I knew these people. They'd spoken in Fort Worth, and I'd heard them, and I'd read the books. But I hadn't been to a camp, so I went with Helen. And they hugged her, and she would draw back, and I would watch her. And finally, uh, the next morning, she said, Ms. Lee, I'm going home. And she drove down there, too. She said, I'm going home, but I'll come back and get you later in the week. And I said, no, Helen, if you go, I'm going too, because I came with you. And if you're going home, I'm going home. Well, that's all that kept her from leaving the camp that day. Well, she, she began to unfold. And, and one day, we st I started to lunch, and I looked ahead of me was Helen. And there was a little woman with a, a one crutch uh, walking on it. And she had quite a limp. And Helen was walking with her arm around that woman. Just took two days to get all of that out of her. Now then, back to the sick room. When after she got back from this trip to Dallas, and she was she was healed. That woman was healed. I saw a miracle, if I never see another one. To see her run down that place and it was a lot longer than this and back around and by the time she got back around she was in running good shape the next day or the next I've forgotten which and she'd never eaten a meal in my house we weren't that close until she became very ill and she called me and she said you know I'm so hungry she'd been living on Gerber's baby food and I said well Helen come over I'd love to have you for lunch and I'll fix anything you tell me if I can find it. She said, I want some hot tamales. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, Lord, that's where my faith was then. Oh, oh, it, oh, God, what will I do? Tamales. I'm a well person, and I, I leave them alone a lot. <laughs> that's Mexican food, if you don't know what, what it is, and it's pretty hot with pepper. And so... But she said she wanted hot tamales. And I walked over to the grocery store, and I got a dozen. They were wrapped in shucks then. Oh, they, they are good, wrapped in shuck. And I got a little chili to pull on them. Just, if she's going to eat hot tamales, she might as well have the chili over. <laughs> so I fixed hot tamales and chili. And the two of us sat down there, and she ate six or seven of those tamales. <laughs> that woman that had been on Gerber's baby food for a long, long time. She was so healed and so beautiful. And I want to tell you something. I felt impressed to share this. I've never shared it. Uh, if I have, I've forgotten it. And so, but this, she'd been given so long to live. And the mother and the father and the aunt, uh, with a fixed fixation in their mind, we're just going to have her so long. She's going to die. Now, I want to tell you, friends, faith works in reverse, too. You can believe that that person is, is never going to change, and as far as you're concerned, they won't. You can believe that person is going to die, and you can help bring it on. So faith works. Be careful which direction your face going. And so I didn't have any faith for tamales, I'll tell you for sure. <laughs> but you know, she, did, she ate those without any ill effects. As upset as I was emotionally, it's a wonder that didn't hurt me. <laughs> well, that was just a little thing I wanted to share. This woman lived about 14 or 15 months and died with cancer. She was surrounded. The closest people around her believed that she was consigned to die in so long, so a given time, and she did. Or, no, it was longer than she lived longer than that she was given. But this is something I felt impelled to share with you. Be careful how your faith goes. You can have faith that that person will be a liar as long as they live, and, and that'll con be conducive and it'll be a help to them to remain liar, a liar, or whatever. Our faith, faith is a, t is a powerful thing. Now, if it's channeled toward God and good, it's tremendous. But you can have faith in evil and produce it. That, I don't charge you for that one. 
I want to. I hope uh, I can go from there to here, with. with uh, uh, but I felt to do this, I really did. I felt like sharing this, and but in this, I want to tell you what came out of all of this, the redemption of those three elderly people, and one of them was as old as. Oh, she was an old lady, probably seventy-five or eight, <laughs> <laughs> and she could. In Texas, we say cuss. She could cuss like a sailor. And I used to drive her to the grocery store, and I'd get so embarrassed, she'd cuss the girl out of there over nothing. She just, she just, who wasn't a bad woman? She just cussed. And she seemed to use it for emphasis. And, and I tell you, she knew how to do it. But gradually, gradually, God gave me a love for that woman. Really, I didn't have much love for her. Because she embarrassed me to death, and I felt sorry for her, and I would, she and her sister didn't get along, and I don't blame her sister. But I would drive her to the grocery store. She'd ask me to take her, not her sister. And so it got pretty bad. And then she got very sick, and it was apparent that she wasn't going to be here long unless something happened, and it was time, I guess, for her to go. She lived a long time. And so I felt so concerned about her meeting God in the shape she's in. Now, he, God is so merciful. I don't think, I've heard Christians cuss a little. And I don't think that'll keep them out of heaven. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't cuss. Wasn't allowed to, probably. Never, we couldn't say gosh at our house. But anyway, I felt such a concern for this dear old soul. And I, one day I was over there and very, very timidly and with hesitation, I said, Miss Guffey, would you like for me to read you something good from the Bible? She said, okay, or all right, and I read her the 23rd Psalm. I thought she might know that one. And so she listened very attentively. Well, I didn't ask her to let me pray for her for a while, but I read her that 23rd Psalm. And then she got to where, if I didn't read it, I didn't go every day, but I would see her maybe two, three times a week. She'd say, read me that piece in the Bible, or that portion in the Bible. And I would read her the 23rd Psalm. You know, that's, that's such a beautiful thing. That's inspired, the, God inspired that writer of Psalms so much, and I suspect that that one Psalm has brought so many people to God. And it's used when people go home in funerals. Well, it shouldn't be just relegated to funerals. It's great. You ought to learn it. And then put your name or somebody else's name in there. The Lord is Tom Shepherd. He shall not want. He shall not want for redemption. He shall not want for peace or whatever. Write your order in there. You're not adding to the scriptures. You're just applying it. And so one day I asked her if I could have a little prayer with her. And she uh, said, yes, I could. I was very, very careful. I prayed, I guess, I was more sensitive than most anybody I ever prayed for because I knew that woman. I didn't want to make her mad. And I, didn't, I wanted to help her. I wanted to be a channel of help for her. And I didn't know anybody else that went to see her that they didn't go to church. So I prayed with her. And then... She, after that, before I would leave, she'd say, I would always read her a scripture if she wanted me to, and then she'd say, well, are you going to pray, or will you pray, or something? And one morning, or one time when I was with her, and I prayed with her, I saw the Lord let me see. We're so result-minded. He doesn't let me see very often, but I saw a change in her countenance. And it was just a few days before she died. Well, that was, that was a beautiful story. But I'm going, and it doesn't really, isn't probably related to what I'm going to talk about, but it must be or the Lord wouldn't have given me two such uh, di difficult, different uh, subjects. If you want to turn to your Bible, I'm going to read a few verses in the 24th Psalm. And I, not long ago I was reading this, and I've read the Psalms all my life. And I'm in 64. Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10. I think about, uh, th this is one of David's psalms. He didn't write them all, but he wrote this one. 
Do you ever wonder about that man, David? You know what he did? He had a man killed and got his wife. But he, God said he was a man after his own heart because he was a repentant sinner. We're all sinners, I still say. We're all sinners, redeemed sinners. And unfortunately, as, as Frank Laubach said, getting to be a Christian doesn't immunize you from sin. It just makes you, it, it fixes you up so you can't enjoy it anymore. <laughs> You're doubly sensitive when you, when you uh, grieve God or do something you shouldn't. And that's God's green light or red light that goes on within us. And so David was, he just broke laws, but he would come, read that 51st Psalm if you don't believe he was a repenter. He was, he was an authority in, in the repentance. He knew how to repent. He, he did sin, but he knew how to come and get forgiveness. Forgiveness has already been purchased. You don't have to beg God to forgive you. Through Christ and his atonement, you're forgiven. All forgiveness is provided. You do have to come and take it for you personally. And David knew how to come back to God, and I don't know how he prayed except that prayer in Psalm 51, and I think that's beautiful, and I've prayed it a few times myself. I never did get anybody killed to get their husband, but then I've been, I've been guilty of doing things I shouldn't do and saying things and thinking things and acting unchristlike. So we're all sinners. All Paul said, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this is one of David's high moments. He must have been at a CFO <laughs> when he wrote this one. He said, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. That's majestic language, isn't it? Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. What, what a statement. Coming out of the heart of this man, the sweet singer of Israel. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about gates and doors. Uh, of course, he was talking about, I think, the temple in Jerusalem, or the tabernacle. Solomon's temple wasn't built till after David, uh, I mean, in David's, didn't get to build it. But God said a beautiful thing, and it's comforted me lots of times. He said, God, I live in a house of cedar, and, and your, your, your house is a tabernacle, and I'm going to build you a house. You know, we can't build God a house. We just invite him in, and he rebuilds this temple and lives in us. That's, But... He said, I'm going to build you a house, God. It's not fair for me to live in a house of cedar and your ark and, and your temple, your worship in a, in a tabernacle. That tabernacle had animal skins around it for curtains. It was a crude thing, I guess, but had lots of beauty too because God was very particular. You read Leviticus and, and Exodus and, and see what God had put into that old tabernacle that traveled. Beautiful things. Beautiful workings. And then the gold and the silver and the brass that was in the temple in Jerusalem. And the gates, Jerusalem is high, you know. It's, it's up on a hill called Zion, too. And it overlooks around all of that area. Those of you who've been there know that. And it's a city set on a hill. And it was a walled city. Uh, many old cities in Europe are still walled, and I think they're so fascinating to see those walled cities and go through those arches. And they'd have, uh, the bigger the victory over the countries, the higher the arch would be that entered in, and oh, it was big. And that reminds me of when I was in uh, Korea last summer, 85, uh, out at Incheon where MacArthur's men landed. And there was a boat out there approximately where his men, where his boat landed. 
and they had this huge museum and a huge arch with MacArthur and his men sculptured on that arch, the landing <coughs> at Inchon Bay. It's a beautiful thing. And back of it, somewhere down a wall, there's water, water flowing. And I was told, well, we saw a wedding ceremony uh, about to take place. Many people come there to get married under that arch. It was a triumph. It was a, a symbol of triumph. Well, Jerusalem is set on a hill, and it's God's. God didn't start in New York City. Did you know that? <laughs> or Texas, even. <laughs> Don't let that get back to the Chamber of Commerce in Texas. <laughs> God started in the Near East, and that was a center where he began, the, in, in the garden, over there between those seas. And... Uh, the Garden of Eden was there. That's where God set up, that's where he started in business, and that's where it's going to be, and it, it will always be his city. It may be in the, it's been in the hands of many uh, enemies, but it's God's city, and eventually he will rule and reign from there. Now, you may not believe that. That's all right, and I didn't mean to. That's, that's not CFO talking. That's getting into doctrine a little bit. But I think David was looking, thinking of that walled city. And uh, he said, lift up your heads, you, you, you gates, and you everlasting doors open up. Friends, we've got gates and doors that keeps the king of glory out of our lives. Or maybe you don't. I discover new gates shut tight in me every now and then. A gate that I'm afraid of this. Fear is an awful gate in itself. Bitterness is an awful gate, and it's hard to open, and it's hard to get uh, so the king of glory can come in. Oh, I thank God that really speaking, he doesn't wait for us to clean up our act before he comes into our heart. All we have to do is say, I want you. And he's been there knocking all these years. And he'll come right in. But those gates, even after we accept Christ, it doesn't make us perfect saints. It takes a lifetime, they tell me, <laughs> to... To you, you just, as long as you live, I can attest to that. It is a continual walk and a continual uh, battle. You're in a battle because we're not going the way the world goes. When I speak of the world, I'm talking about the unregenerate world, those who haven't yet found God and do not know that, that his peace and joy and forgiveness is theirs. Everybody. The scripture says it's not, my will that any should perish, but that not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. It was God's will when He sent His Son and paid such a price. He redeemed the whole world, but some of them won't receive it. Now that's God didn't fail; He made provision, and so this this David. And I don't know whether he had his harp with him when he was singing this, but I think he sang it. When I was a little girl, I used to go to church with my little neighbor, and she was an elderly woman, and it was the ARP church, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian, and they sing just the Psalms and some of the weirdest tunes I ever heard. But they were beautiful Psalms, and they sang this simple. Ye gates lift your heads, and an entrance display. They changed it just a little bit to make it rhyme. Ye everlasting doors, wide open the way. Now, that didn't mean a thing to me when I was a child, but I think back on it now, and it's beautiful. Ye gates, lift your heads, and an entrance display. Ye everlasting doors, wide open the way. And then what's going to happen when you do that? You've got to open the gates. You've got to open the door. Oh, I do wish I wouldn't lose my place. And then he goes on and gives us a little clue of what he's talking about. 
and the king of glory shall come in. That's the strongest verb. The king of glory shall come in. It doesn't say often he does or he's apt to or at certain times he comes in. He says the king of glory shall come in. We open the gates. We open the doors. I loved that picture of his knocking on the door. There's royalty at the door this morning, knocking. And we've got gates shut, and we've got doors shut. And the person knocking on the door is the price, the one given for the ransom for the whole world, and yet he waits. He will not barge in, and that's a a Texas word, but I, it just fits, it, it, it satisfies me what I want to say. He will not come in without your permission, even your invitation. Oh, I love him for standing at my door so long and still standing there today and knocking. Thelma, there's more territory in you. Open your gate a little wider. Open your door a little wider. Lift up your gates. Lift up your gates. And the king of glory shall come in. Now, he has come in to me when I was 12 years old. He didn't have much room in my place, a little bitty place he had in my house, this temple. But he stayed there. Bless him, he didn't leave because I didn't give him much place to stay. I just gave him, I just had a ticket so that if I died, I'd go to heaven, and that's about it. I didn't invite him in and talk to him. I, I can't, if I go to Ruth and Wayne's house and they just say, come in, Thelma, and sit down and go on about their work for a week and never ask me to eat with them or never speak to me, I'd leave. I wouldn't be there a week. <laughs> I've been in two houses where I knew I wasn't wanted and it's, it's terrible. <laughs> I, it's not in this area, I'll tell you that. They're on the West Coast, both of them. But anyway, I don't want, he comes and he waits until we welcome him in to take more of us, more of our thinking. If he can get this part of us, oh, if someone had made it known to me 40 years ago that Jesus wanted to live up here too. He didn't get in up here until I was, I'd walked with him a long time but I didn't know much about him. I kept him confined right here, and I brought him out on Sunday mornings and maybe Wednesday night, and then he went back into his place, and, and I didn't contact him or talk to him, but he didn't leave. Isn't he loving? He'll take what we offer him, this king of glory. Well, I'm ahead of myself. I, I didn't mean to tell you that in that verse. <laughs> and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? That's what the psalmist. Why, he knew. I'm so glad he wrote that. All through the ages, people have had to answer that question with yes, with one answer or another. Who is this king of glory? Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? That marvelous little English fella wrote that song, whom do, whom do men say that I am? You've heard him on TV. I forgot his name, but I've been in the church where he's from. Uh, Andrew Culpeborough. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, he, this, this, we, everyone in every generation has to answer who is this king of glory. Is he king of glory? I was reading recently about what Pilate had put over Jesus when he died. I just thank God for his power over all the powers of evil. And the devil smirked so, and he thought he had was rid of Jesus and that Nazarene, and he wouldn't have any more trouble with him. He just didn't know what was ahead. Over that, over that, cruci over that piece of, of wood there, that harsh piece of wood, it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. I think Pilate almost really became a Christian. Maybe he did. I don't know. But 
If you read his encounter with Jesus, it leaves you thinking that just he knew he was true. He began to believe he was the truth. And he said, I see no fault in this man, and et cetera, and et cetera. But when they accused him of saying he was a king, then he had to do something because the people said, you don't, he's claiming and said, There's, we have one king but Caesar, and they hated Caesar. But anything to get rid of Jesus. But that Pilate said, I don't know what that is in Greek. Uh, Wayne's a lingu linguist. I'm not. I, I know Texan, and that's about it. But he, he said, in Greek and Latin and Hebrew, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He declared something, Pilate. But he, he put it in the language of the known world then. And, and they, want, they questioned that. They didn't like that a bit. They didn't believe he was even king of the Jews. Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And it stood. There it was for the whole world to read in every language. The whole world was included in that. Well, isn't that marvelous? How can you be so quiet? <laughs> Who is this king of glory? It, it, he was Jesus of Nazareth. In me, he's the resurrected Christ that's conquered death, hell, and the grave. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. You know that song, don't you? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And a dear, dear friend of mine, Ira Stanfield, wrote, I don't know, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its clouds may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future. For I know what Jesus said. So today, he walks beside me, and he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he holds my hand. And he wrote that song out of dire heartbreak and desperation. Well, I know this King of Glory a little Compared to some of the precious people that I've been privileged to work with, I feel like a neophyte. I've been on the road for a number of years, but I didn't seem to make much speed. But this king of glory, I know, I have at least a relationship with him. And we're on speaking terms. I talk to him, and occasionally he talks to me here not in my ears, but I get impressions that could only come from God. They're so far above my conception and ideas. And they bring such a wonderful feeling of peace when it's all over. And he says something to me. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes he's reproving me and I don't feel so peaceful then. But it leads to peace. It brings me to a place of, <laughs> of asking forgiveness or receiving forgiveness and going on and that, anything that does that is of the Lord. Who is this king of glory? And you know what that eighth verse says? He answers it for us in case we don't know. The Lord. Uh, the Lord, strong and mighty. We've been singing that chorus. Strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Oh, I've underscored that line. Who is this king of glory? It's the Lord mighty in battle. Are you in a battle? How many battles? This is where we learn who he is in the battle. He is the Lord mighty in battle. Mighty in battle. Oh, that's the that's the royal guest that knocked at that's all right, never mind. That's the royal guest that knocked at my heart's door for years and still knocking. Thank you. It didn't break. Thank you, Lord. Someday I'm not gonna need that. But I want us to think about this. Who is this Lord of glory to you? What is he to me? Some know him as the Redeemer of the world. Some know him as their peace. Some know him even in contentment. 
rare people that know Jesus in contentment. Paul did. He said, I learned whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I said, he wasn't a Texan. <laughs> this, is, this is what it means to be, to have the Lord of glory living within us. He doesn't make calls, weekly calls. He said in John 15, if you keep my commandments, the Father will love you. And we, the Father and I, will come in and make our abode. That's moving in to stay, permanent residence. And that's what he has within us, permanent residence. Now, you can, you can leave him, I suppose. I think I've known a few that have. Uh, this, this is another thing that we we're not discussing. But uh, he'll never leave me. That's the important thing. No matter what I do, no matter where I go, I take this royal guest that lives in my house, my temple. He no longer is behind that Holy of Holies curtain. It was rent from the top to the bottom, and I think that was 40 feet high. And, they, and it was made of material they couldn't have very well, like silk, just split it. It was a heavy thing. And that curtain was rent once and for all. And the place into the Holy of Holies is my privilege to enter it now and yours. The, the Spirit of God dwelt over this seat, mercy seat in the ark. And only one man could go in there, and he could only go once a year. And he had little bells on the bottom of his skirts, his robe, so that if he went in there and there was sin on the line in his life, if he went before God and he went for his own sins and the sins of the nation to, to atone. Only he couldn't atone. They just paid the interest from year to year on what they owed. And no debt could be canceled till Jesus came and paid the debt with his own blood. But one man could enter only once a year, and that was the Day of Atonement. And now every cfo -er, Every Methodist, every Baptist, every Presbyterian, you name it, can go into that Holy of Holies. They can dwell there if they choose. As our mind leads us and our desires of our heart direct us, we can spend as much time in the Holy of Holies as we choose. And I don't deserve it one bit. There's not anything I could do to deserve to go into God's holy place. We sang that song, we're standing in his presence on holy ground. You know, I read once, I wouldn't dare say this about myself, but I read that if Jesus Christ is living in you, everywhere you go, you're on holy ground. But we sang that, we're, we're standing in his presence on holy ground. Doesn't that do something to you? If we could keep that awareness, wouldn't our lives be different? And wouldn't the kingdom of God go forth on an escalator? If we could keep that attitude, I'm in the presence of the Lord, mighty in battle, and he's in me, and this battle is not too much for him. He is the Lord. He's called the Lord of hosts, too. Now, in case you missed it the first time, you know the Bible is very, very uh, good at repetition. It reiterates in the next, that's their style of writing. You ever notice Proverbs? And then there's an antithesis in Proverbs. You didn't know I knew that name, did you? <laughs> well, this is, this is talking about uh, the, the Lord mighty, mighty in battle. Who is this king of glory? Well, he's in me and he's in you. And if he isn't in you, he's still knocking. And he's knocking again at, with all of us. And you never arrive in this world. There's always something out there to, to, to experience, to learn, to overcome. As long as we live, we walk with him and under the direction of the Spirit, hopefully, and enabled by the Spirit, or we couldn't walk with him. How can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible says. So the Spirit of God needs agreeing vessels 
He needs people with temples where Jesus is welcome and, and the will agrees with the spirit that, that temple down here where he dwells and where he speaks to us and guides us and he, we feel his presence here. That's where you feel hunger too. And that's where you feel compassion and that's where you feel revulsion. And it's a center of, of feeling. He lives there, somewhere down there. His spirit is wed with mine. And that's where we're one. And when I forget that, then as far as I'm concerned, I'm on my own. And it scares me to death to forget that I'm there. I'm one with this Lord of hosts that's mighty in battle. Aren't we blessed to have living within us this Lord of hosts, high and lifted up, that's mighty in battle? What would we do if we didn't have a Lord that was mighty in battle. Life is full of battles, or have you discovered that? Amen. There'd never be a victory. We'd never be overcomers if we didn't have battles. If there's nothing to overcome, there's no victory. I don't like battles. I hate fights. I run from them. Always did. I don't want to get involved in fights of any kind, particularly church fights. <laughs> They're the worst. Because it's the body of Christ, one part warring against the other. And I believe it grieves his heart like nothing else. I really think, and I've told you since I've been here, I don't presume to know the mind of God with my finite mind. But I've got the idea that the blatant sins of the unregenerate do not hurt him like the warring sins of the body of Christ that have accepted him. And accepted him as Lord and then revert back to their old natures and began vying for position and politics and whatever you have. Now the churches in West Virginia may, don't, may not have that, but the ones in Texas, some of them do. Now God is mighty in battle, but there, there are many times when there's R&R &R periods. Isn't that what they call it, fellas? R&R, &R, rest and relaxation, I think that means. You're not in a battle continually. He knows when we've been at the front as long as we can take it. And so he comes to our rescue and gives us an R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. And oh, how precious they are. Well, there are gates against God. Gates keep things out and they keep things in. We choose what we keep in. We can't choose what's without. We have nothing to do with what's on the outside trying to get in. But we can choose whether we let them in our gate or our door. So, friends, let's open our doors. This is the third day of camp, middle of the week. We should reach a peak about today. Let's open our doors and our gates and ask this king of glory to come in that's mighty in battle. He delights when we give him more room. He delights when we open the gate a little bit more. He delights when we desire to have him ruling more and more in our life. It isn't that he just wants us to be slaves and he wants to have the dominion over us. It's for our good. He knows we can't make it on our own and be happy. He's created us that way, so we have to have God to fill this void within us that only Jesus can fill. I don't care what we have. You hear top athletic, athletic pros and movie actors and every, pe every class of people, I've heard them witness, that they reached the top and they thought, is this all there is to it? Well, I'm not speaking from there. I'm speaking from here. But I want you to know I found the secret, a little bit of the secret of what it means to have the king of glory living in this temple of clay, not, not in, a, in a visible temple with walls, but this temple can throw up walls or it can pull them down. I have the choice. What are you going to do? This king of glory wants to come in more and more and more. And the more he comes in, the more of all of his wonderful nature he brings. You're more loving. Your marriage is enhanced. Your romance with your husband or your wife is enhanced 100%. You really don't know love until you have the love of God flowing with the love you have for each other. 
You haven't known marital bliss till you bring God's love into that union. That's the way God made it to be. And oh, the world is so in the dark and they get divorces and that doesn't solve it. Well, I, I can't solve the problems of the world, but I can keep my own gates open and my own doors open and try to keep the Amelie with centered in the Lord of glory, mighty in battle in me. And that's all he requires of me today. God bless you. Keep your doors and gates open.